Well, thank you very much for that introduction, John, and uh, thanks for bringing us together. In uh, <clears throat> It would indeed be even nicer if we'd been uh, in the uh, pleasant surroundings of the British Academy that we all know uh, and love so well. Um, and we'd had the prospect not only of putting money in the donation box, but also of raising a glass to celebrate this uh, big book that we are here to talk about. Well, sadly, the glass likes up like... Uh, Perhaps not, perhaps not the donation, as you suggested, uh, uh, will have to remain virtual. But the book is by no means virtual. It is, um, <clears throat> you can see there, it's, it's a big book. And it's about a big man, as Venice Ellis was famously described in, I think, 1919, during the Paris Peace Conference at the end of the First World War. So we're, <clears throat> we're here to talk about this big man, um, as John said, you know, a, a, the sort of gigantic figure who bestrides 20th century Greek politics. Many would say the, really the only Greek um, politician of modern times to achieve the status of, you know, be regarded as a statesman on the world stage. But unlike many other statesmen, I mean, Venizelos has the, un, it's the remarkable position that during his lifetime and right up to today, his supporters have always referred to him as the savior of the nation. And just about as many other people have held him personally, morally responsible for the greatest disaster ever to befall that nation, the defeat by the Turkish nationalists in uh, <clears throat> the autumn 1922. So which is he, savior or devil, um, angel or demon? Um, hard-headed statesman surely he was and in this book between these uh, mighty covers we have the first half of the story I would remind you this is volume one of a planned two-volume biography of Eleutherius Venizelos and it takes the story from his birth in 1864 to 1914. Now that's quite enough from me by way of introduction. So before we get into the kind of Q&A uh, format, uh, Michael, could I invite you to give us your kind of introduction to the book and or to the subsequent conversation this evening? By all means, thank you, Roddy. And uh, thank you, John, for bringing, bringing us together uh, and Welcome to all those out there who are following us somewhere out in the ether. Uh, I thought I'd start with two thoughts, quite concrete, arising from the book itself. Roddy showed the cover of it, and there it is too. That's an early photograph of Venizelos on the front cover, taken probably fairly soon after the death of his first wife. And um, it leads me to point to the illustrations in the book, which I think are part of the interest, and in particular, the sort of things that people usually go to first. Uh, the illustrations uh, don't contain many good photographs of Venizelos himself. He was a very photogenic character, as Richard Clogg has pointed out in his writings. Uh, but at the, at the time of which we're speaking, he was not a world figure and therefore didn't attract so much attention from the various photographers in Kanya and Crete. That was to change. But meanwhile, there are some wonderful photos which were taken by the photographer of Prince George of Greece, who became High Commissioner in Crete and had a well-known struggle for power with Venizelos. And I commend those because uh, the, there's the two of them next to each other. Um, there are many more, including uh, some of the international forces in Crete in the late 19th and early 20th century, which are very fine examples of the photographer's art. And uh, these come from the literary society Chrysostomos in Kanya, courtesy of the uh, chairman of the society, 
Costas Mavrakakis. The other thing that I'd like to point to before we get further going is that, uh, here we are, that's the man himself. Um, photographs are not the only images we should have in mind. There's a lot of folk art concerning Venezuelos, particularly during the Balkan Wars, uh, popular lithographs, which you still see around, and these little busts, which come from Kanya, you can pick them up for a song uh, in the shop near the cathedral in Kanya. And there's one of Venezuelos wearing his characteristic skull cap. There we are. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say by way of introduction is that um, the captions at the head of each chapter, in a sense, tell the story. And I do think that they are uh, parts of the book that you should give some attention to if and when you read it. Uh, I've tried in making these little headings to the chapters to uh, give space to contrary views. There's quite a lot of Venezuelos on his own political philosophy and so on. But there's also his opponents, there's uh, the Dragumis family, Stefanos Dragumis, who was prime minister, who became an opponent, um, Ion Dragumis, who was murdered by uh, Venizelos's followers uh, later on, uh, and others. And um, these, in a way, encapsulate the book. Uh, one favorite I found was of from Prince Nicholas, Prince Nicholas, the younger brother of uh, George, Prince George of Greece and of Constantine, crown prince who became king. Uh, and Prince Nicholas commented, first of all, he uh, had a lot of time for Venizelos. He admired his intelligence and his, uh, even his ambitions in the early stages. Later on, he described him as very intelligent ambitious, totally unscrupulous, and cretin. And that and cretin uh, says a lot about the attitudes of the royal family at that time. Um, this is, of course, after uh, Venizelos' run in with Prince George, which soured the royal family towards him. But a better quote on which to end is from the prime minister the great prime minister, Harilaus Tricupis, who said, the English are our only neighbors. They alone touch us everywhere. And with that, I hand over back to you, Roddy. Uh, well, thank you, thank you. And uh, I'm, I'm glad you highlighted the, um, the, Im the images in the book because actually some of those, I mean, I think many of them are very rare, a lot I'd never seen before. And they actually, it actually is a kind of treasure trove of early and rare black and white photographs, particularly of Crete at the end of the 19th century. And just to pick up on what you were saying just then, I mean, one of the, um, I think, marvelous things about this book is that as well as being the personal biography of the man Venizelos, um, because of the roles that he played both in Crete um, his native Crete and in Greece where he became prime minister, um, a, a thoroughly researched biography such as this ends up being also an authoritative history of late 19th century Crete and the whole story of how Crete became part of the Greek state, which I think is actually rather little understood um, uh, I remember perhaps even in Greece and certainly abroad, as well of, of course as being a history of Greece itself during tumultuous times. But I wanted just to um, to ask you a little bit about the, you know, the, about the writing of the book. Um, I think it's not a secret that uh, it's it's been quite a long time in the making. I seem to remember it was quite a long time ago that you and I first uh, talked about this. Uh, would you like to? Talk, tell us a little bit about how you came to decide to write the biography of Venizelos and then um, maybe how it 
grew into two volumes and um, you know at what stage uh, quite how you see that structural division that now we have one volume and not the other becomes actually really quite important. It goes back a long way. Uh, it goes back actually to the uh, doctoral thesis I wrote at St Anthony's College Oxford which was about Greece in Asia Minor uh, and you can't write about Greece in Asia Minor without becoming interested in Venizelos. And then I realized after that, that um, if you don't go for the early stages of Venizelos's life and the later stages after the Asia Minor catastrophe, then you're not going to understand the whole picture. So that gradually led me towards the idea of writing a biography. And um, the additional factor, I suppose, was serving in Athens, as um, was mentioned, in the 1980s and then in the 1990s, and living in this house, wonderful house, which was commissioned by Venizelos's second wife, Helena Skilitsi, on behalf of Venizelos, then prime minister. Uh, and when Venizelos died, she then sold the building to the British government. So I had every opportunity working in the British Embassy to become familiar with the aura of Venizelos, as it were. Uh, and when I was there as ambassador, uh, we got a, a, a bust of Lloyd George, who has an intimate relationship with Venizelos, as you know. Uh, and put that in the living room of the embassy. And uh, uh, Doris Skura, the press officer of the embassy at that time, procured two uh, portraits in oils of Venizelos and his wife, which we put downstairs in the so-called Venizelos Library. And I'm sure many people who are watching this today will have seen those various uh, evidences of Venizelos's presence there. Um, I had a lot of help over the years from people working in the embassy, other Greek friends, Greek historians, uh, and, uh, and a succession of British ambassadors. The latest, Kate Smith, uh, managed to unearth an enormous trunk belonging to Venizelos, which is now in the uh, entrance to the residence of the embassy uh, and is a fine piece of work. I wouldn't like to carry even half of it. Um, so that's a, a part of the background. Now, the second half of your question was about, um, well, the first half was how long ago it all started. The second half was more about the structure of the book. Uh, and I think you wanted to know why we cut it off at a certain point and uh, turned it into two volumes. Well, the answer to that is it was getting too long. And maybe that's a, a fault, but I wasn't going to sort of cut enormous amounts out of the book in order to fit it into one volume. So there it was, having taken the decision to divide it, the question was where? Mm. Now there is a sort of Greek um, consensus almost on looking at the decade from 1910 to 1920 as a, as a unity. And this goes back to a friend of Venizelos, uh, George Vendiris, who wrote a classic book Greece 1910 to 1920. But uh, I'd already got past 1910 by that point uh, when we started thinking about where to make the division. Uh, so that impelled me towards a somewhat later break. And I think there's a logic in the break we made in 1914 because uh, that enables one to include the Balkan Wars in the first volume and they follow naturally from Venizelos's first period as prime minister. Uh, whereas in 1914, 
there really is a natural break with the beginning of the Great War. So I decided to make the change at that point. And uh, Michael Dwyer, the publisher of Hearst Books, agreed with that, with the comment, let's take two bites of the cherry. I was just going to follow up because I noticed you said we on a number of occasions. And yeah. um, I, I, I imagine that was referring to your publisher, your publisher Hearst. Um, is there, do you want to say a bit more about you know, their involvement and how, how they have, how the firm or the person in, de, in particular has contributed to the story so far? Uh, how far Hearst as publisher contributed? No, yeah, yes. Um, just by yeah. with, how closely you've worked with them, I suppose. Uh, the answer is recently, very closely, uh, but for many years, not very closely, because I was just getting on with doing the research and, and writing. Uh, but the closer you get to a publication date, uh, the closer the involvement becomes. And um, the connection with Hearst goes back to Christopher Hearst himself who uh, commissioned a, a new edition of my book about Asia Minor, Ionian Vision, uh, which had been published some time before, but um, he thought it was worth a, another run at it. And that led me to Hearst, and Michael Dwyer took over after Christopher Hearst died. So it's been a, a fruitful relationship and uh, I trust it'll go on being uh, into and beyond uh, volume two. We shall see. Well, that's very good to know. And I mean, I would, I mean, I, it's just the opportunity to, to get in the fact that um, they have done a beautiful job on the production. The production values are extremely high. And I think with all the pressures on publishing these days, that's something um, I could imagine you're very, very pleased, very pleased with, and um, I think you know we should all be duly grateful to the to Hearst Publishers. Well, the other thing that I am very pleased with is the fact that they've priced the book very reasonably, uh, and by contrast with academic publications these days, uh, that is really quite something, because you know the student at university can't afford to buy. Uh, the publications which come off the academic presses, they're, they're just too expensive. Whereas Hearst, what does he say? I'm looking for the price. It's £25, I think, something like that, which, uh, uh, and, and probably with discounts from time to time, that, that is a reasonable and accessible book. Well, at just over 500 pages, I think that's a pretty good, uh, pretty good um, value for money, if I may say so. And of course, the other thing, of course, is if we had been in the congenial surroundings of the British Academy, I'm sure there would have been a, a, a book stall at the back of the room. And um, it's one of the advant advantages of a real book launch is that the public publishers often are able to offer a further discount for those who turn up. I'm afraid we're not able to do that virtually, at least I don't know of any such arrangement. But no. Let's move on from the, uh, the publisher now to Venizelos himself as the subject of a biography. Um, because, you know, the, I mean, you're a historian and you've written <coughs> um, authoritatively about Crete, about the history of Greece and the, <coughs> uh, uh, the, um, in the First World War, um, the Olympic Games, and, uh, you know, fairly kind of relatively, shall we say, objective matters. When you get into, you know, a biography is also, you're getting into the sort of, um, uh, you know, the sort of inner world of the individual you're writing about. And, um, you know, so to draw my own experience, you know, when you're writing about a, a writer or an artist, there's a kind of rich inner world that's very heavily documented and the biographer can really go to town on using and interpreting with, someone who lived, so far as we can see, really entirely in the real world, um, a, a, a man of action and of public words. You know, the Venizelos beyond the public Venizelos, kind of, is there one? How do you get to that person? Or perhaps from the point of view of a historical biographer, maybe you're not, you know, you don't even try. Um, 
I was thinking, you know, as a subject for a biography, he's irresistible because it's just such a, you know, it's like Mount Everest, he's there. But is he, in the nature of the evidence, the nature of the man himself, is he unknowable? Is he an unscrutable, in, an inscrutable figure? Um, did you experience that as a difficulty? And if you did, would you, could you tell us something about how you, dealt, how you dealt with it? Good question, as I say. Um, he is not unknowable or the public aspects obviously are not unknowable because he is proclaiming them to all and sundry. Uh, the inner man is much more difficult to get at with Venizelos as with some other people. Um, he didn't keep diaries except on rare occasions. He was always writing, however. He was writing letters to all and sundry. Uh, he, he wrote a, a diary for a short time at the climax of the uh, negotiations in Paris, which led to the Greek landing at uh, Izmir, Smyrna. Um, but it's, it, it's, it's not a document which provides insights into the inner man. It records in fairly sparse terms uh, what Lloyd George said to him and what Clemenceau said and what mm. President Wilson said. Are you ready? Have you got troops? So we, we, we've just decided to authorize the Greek uh, Navy to uh, steam towards Smyrna and Greek troops to be landed there. It's that sort of thing. Um, there was emotion behind it, however, because there is a record of Venizelos uh, taking to the streets of Paris or one of the, the parks and sitting down on a bench and weeping uh, at that climactic moment. So, you know, he was, he was a nervous man. He was emotional, but he repressed a lot of the emotion in his uh, public dealings uh, and he, he he doesn't he doesn't emote except uh, and this is interesting in his love affair with uh, Maria Cataluzu his first wife mm -hmm. uh, now some people doubt whether he was really in love with her at all but I think anybody who actually reads his letters will conclude that he was. Um, they, are, they have a lyrical strain to them, which I haven't found anywhere else in Venizelos's writing. So um, there's a chapter about them in, in the book, following rather closely the dialogue between them. And of course, uh, they exist because he'd taken to exile temporarily because of an uprising in Crete in 1889. Uh, and he felt he had to go to Athens to get away from the Turkish authorities who might otherwise have arrested him, uh, unjustifiably, but they might have. Uh, so uh, he was by then engaged to Maria uh, and a passionate correspondence ensued, which is, which is well worth reading. Uh, on the more general question, you know, the, the inner man and the outer man. He lived most of his life in public. Uh, he had friends, but politicians don't have many friends. Uh, politicians in any country, uh, they have temporary attachments, uh, which do not last as a rule. And this applies also to Venizelos in many cases. He was prepared to sever his relationships with politicians if they stepped out of line and sacked them. Um, his friends tended to be Cretans whom he'd known in childhood uh, and he always hankered after Crete. That's the best I can do by way of an answer. Well, thank you. And I'm, I'm glad you highlighted those, um, those human frailties or just human, the human dimension. Um, I mean, I thought, indeed, I thought that the chapter about his um, his courtship and uh, and brief marriage um, in his, in the early days was 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 rather it was rather moving actually, um, mm. 
what you were saying about his about being emotional obviously we don't have that 1919 moment that you mentioned just now <clears throat> but it was certainly new to me and i was it was a, a, a uh, and again, a human touch in the early chapters, just how much he seemed to suffer from various kind of ailments in his childhood and adolescence, um, which, some which sounded rather psychosomatic. I don't know what you think about that. I think that's quite likely. I don't know enough to speak with authority on that, but um, you know, he had problems with his stomach, which come out in the book uh, at school. Uh, he had problems with his leg, he had phlebitis, so uh, he took to riding on a donkey when he visits Spetses, as a well-known photo of him on a donkey. Uh, he had nervous attacks from time to time, which are described in one of the chapters of the book by Manusos Kundras, uh, another great Cretan, great is perhaps not the right word, but a distinguished Cretan politician. Uh, and psychosomatic, there's the case I mentioned after the death of uh, Maria, his first wife, when his, his grief seems to be excessive and unduly prolonged. Now, that's a difficult thing to say about somebody who's just lost his wife. Uh, but his own contemporaries said it. They, they said he should have been able to come round quicker, uh, but he, as it were, wallowed in it. Uh, when, when he did come round, he came round with vigour and uh, returned to his life as an uh, aspirant journalist, politician and lawyer. Um, and he didn't look back. Uh, at least, it, sorry, he did look back because he told everybody that he would never marry again. And this is characteristic of Venizelos. He, he said this uh, time and time again to his friends in Crete and then later to uh, Virginia Benaki. Um, and he, he said, Madame Benaki, don't ask me if I'm going to marry again. I've had one wife and that's for life. And then, of course, he marries again. He marries Helen Eskilitsi. Uh, just as, I suppose you could say, he keeps saying, I'm going to leave politics. I'm finished. You know, when he loses the election in 1920, he goes off into exile to France in the first, case, in the first instance. Uh, and I'm not going to come back. Don't ask me. He writes to all his friends saying this. But of course, he does come back and becomes prime minister again. He couldn't give up the politics. Well, thank you. I mean, this is so. What we've we've got a rounded we've got a a rounded Venezuela. It's a human Venezuela. He's not just the, um, you know, the savior or devil, whichever side you you're on. He he has he does have an emotional side, despite, as you were saying, the lack of evidence, but there is some, and <clears throat> you certainly um, bring that uh, very, uh, bring that very vividly into the frame. And I was just thinking about some of the, you know, what perhaps we could say about, because, uh, you know, as you know, a great deal has been written on Venizelos inevitably, <clears throat> and of very variable both approach and one might say quality. Um, I mean, other things that, you know, I thought this book particularly brought to the table um, are the way, you know, it's judicious, there's constantly balanced, you know, you're constantly evaluating and it's balanced. You're not, as many of his biographers have been, you're not um, sort of riding a charger um, from a particular corner of the field. Um, it's a, seems to me, an entirely non-partisan discussion of strengths and weaknesses. It may be, I don't know how you feel about this, it may be that, <clears throat> um, you know, those of us who are not Greek writing about Greek politics and Greek individuals can or inevitably bring a slightly different perspective to bear um, from those who are, you know, whose own lives and families are closer. Um, and finally, that everything you say about the individual is very thoroughly contextualized, both in the local history of Crete, the national history of Greece, and the broader history of Europe and the world. Um, 
Having said all that, what I was going to ask you was, you know, what uh, are there other things you would like to highlight that you feel this, your approach to Venizelos and this book brings that um, you know, wasn't there before? Well, we haven't finished yet. I mean, this is the problem. I'm still in sort of uh, in the middle of it all. I think he, what I find striking about him is how, uh, first of all, obviously, he is somebody who divides people and he has his role in the initial stages of the Zikasmos, the schism in Greece. Um, I don't say he was responsible for it, but he he shares the responsibility for it because it takes two to, to make a quarrel. Uh, there are very good reasons for what he did, but he did them. Um, it, when you look at the qualities of Venizelos and his um, the features of his political personality, uh, you almost always find that there is an opposite to uh, your first conclusion. And this, for this, I, I would quote the obituary of him written by the founder editor of Casimirini, Georgios Vlakos, distinguished uh, journalist, uh, a strong anti venezuelist And he says things in his obituary, uh, which is a sort of masterpiece of rhetoric and should not be taken literally all of it, but he says, uh, that Venizelos contained in himself everything, all the qualities and, and the defects of those qualities. I'm paraphrasing what Vlachos said, uh, but what, he's, what he is saying is uh, highlighting the capacity of Venizelos to wrong foot people by changing his mind as a start. I mean, he, he is a radical politician in Crete, a liberal, a, a radical liberal. People in Athens think that he is radical and probably Republican, and he shows them that that is wrong. He, it's not what he believes. And then there's a gradual process, which I suppose is natural in politicians, as in uh, people like us, Roddy, uh, towards a greater conservatism as life goes on. It may not apply to you, but it applies to many people. And it applied to Venizelos. And you see in his later political career uh, how the patriarch takes over from the, uh, the lively young radical of the Cretan years and the first years after he, he has been in Crete. I've got, I've got Vlachos here, uh, let me just read it. Um, he says, because this man, Eleftherios Venizelos, was not, as others are, a common organism, good or bad, small or great, timid or brave, straight or crooked. He was something more than these and all of them together, a manifestation of all these to their greatest strength in their highest form. And then later on he says, everywhere present and present in his absence, which is a, a very acute comment because even from Paris in his exile, Venizelos's shadow is cast as far as Greece and everybody is waiting to see how he's gonna, how he's gonna move next. And Vlachos ends by saying, uh, uh, may he have rest and perhaps the country will succeed in finding rest too, which was a, a grave misjudgment on the part of the editor of Cathy Marini. Well, Vlachos got a number of things wrong, didn't he? Not least his famous editorial in 1922, but um, I, that, that the presence of the 
the presence of the absence. I mean, that is that that there's certainly foresight in that, isn't there? Because Venizelos has never, you know, the absence of Venizelos remains a strong presence in Greece even today. And I mean, again, I mean, in terms of his own personal legacy, but then there's also that curious dynastic fact that you know the current prime minister is actually descended from two different sides of his family. So there is the legacy; it, it works in extraordinary uh, ways. That's right. I can't resist saying, Roddy, um, that the present prime minister, great nephew of, uh, of Venizelos, uh, Mitsotakis, took the opportunity of his interview uh, on World Book Day recently to note favorably your book and my book, the new book about Venizelos, um, as worth attention of the Greek readership. And that is uh, extremely satisfying for anybody who wants to uh, be read by a Greek audience as well as a British and American and other audience. Well, perhaps between us, we can return the compliment and say that certainly for myself, I wish more prime ministers around the world read books at all, let alone ours. But yeah. I, I well, appreciate that as I think you do. Venizelos did read books. He, he was a tremendous reader. And um, the municipal library in Kenya is full of his library books, which he's annotated. So it's a source of interest to historians as well as being uh, a good library. Absolutely. I wanted to move on to a topic that's probably sort of top of the agenda for, you know, for people who know maybe not very much about Venizelos, probably the first thing that comes to mind is you know, Venizelos versus the King, the national schism during yeah. the First World War. Now, I know that's not part of volume one, but you know, the shadow of that story actually <clears throat> runs, you know, I think it runs through volume one as, as it's bound to do. And that, you know, that's probably the that's probably you know the starting point for many people who come to Venezuela. So that um, <clears throat> you know that clash of titans that really tore Greece apart during the 19 teens, and because of that, um, you know Greece is divided into Venezuelists and what's the other side? Sometimes they're called anti-Venezuelists. As often as not, they're called royalists, facili key. Um, but so there's a kind of perception that Venizelos was a Republican and that, you know, he was the archetypal enemy of the royal family. Now, you, you argue, I mean, you more than argue, you demonstrate, I think very convincingly, that during the period covered the, by this book, that was actually not the case. Um, there were reasons why people thought he was Republican and there were situations where he did um, take up the cudgels against the royal family, um, but uh, I mean, I believe you, having read this very carefully, that it wasn't a matter of ideology. But or perhaps all the more surprising then, that the story, which is much less well known, of his personal run-in with Prince George, who was the governor of Crete uh, during the first five, six years of the 20th century, that run-in between Venizelos as an elected politician with a royal head of state parachuted in on top. Um, in its, some of the finer details, it prefigures the actions that Venizelos himself would take against King Constantine and vice versa um, in the following decade. And I wonder if you can say something about, you know, to what, I know the, we don't have volume two yet, but to what extent does your close reading of events in Crete between 1901 and 1906, does that actually help us to understand why Venizelos did the things he did in the 19-teens and or to query justify them? Yes. Um, I mean, th there are close links between the, uh, the periods, uh, the period of Venizelos and Prince George and Venizelos later with King Constantine, but there are also differences. I mean, one difference is that in Crete, uh, although he was, until he got sacked by the prince, although he was a councillor 
for justice and foreign affairs. Uh, he, he didn't have his own personal standing uh, and a vote of the Cretan people. He would have liked to have that, but he didn't. Mm -hmm. And um, for a long time, he continued not to. Uh, so he, he was in a way on his own. He couldn't do what he did in 1915 with King Constantine of rely on a massive parliamentary majority. And perhaps that was a lesson he, he learned from Crete. He, he, he never had a very easy time in Cretan politics, for one reason or another. Uh, he made his name in Cretan politics, largely because of his confrontation with Prince George, which people in Athens, Republicans, army officers and others uh, admired, but he didn't find it easy. And it's interesting that as soon as he became prime minister in Greece, uh, he one of the first things he did was to stop the Cretan deputies, parliamentary deputies, from entering the Greek parliament as they had been trying to do for some time. Uh, so, you know, he made a, a, a rapid switch from Cretan politician interested in Greek affairs to Greek politician, prime minister, looking for the good of the country. And that entailed keeping the Cretan members of parliament out of the Greek parliament for the time being. And when people talk about the, the sort of courage of political courage of Venizelos, it's that sort of thing they think about, that he was happy to incur the hostility of his old comrades, some, some of them, mm. uh, yeah. in the greater interest of the country in staying out of a war with Turkey. I, I've only half answered your question. Um, well, that, that, shall, I, shall I add to that a little bit? What do you want uh, to? Please do. On 1915, um, on 1915, the issue was whether to enter the Great War on the side of the Entente Allies. And he took an early and decisive decision that that was what Greece ought to do. Uh, now, the issue between him and the king was an issue of parliamentary sovereignty. Uh, he, he, he couldn't see why uh, the king should call all the shots in foreign policy. That was a tradition, traditional attribute of Greek kings, uh, but it was not entrenched in the constitution. Uh, and so he decided to challenge it. Uh, in Crete, uh, it, it was not quite the same because as I mentioned, he didn't have that parliamentary majority. So he was on his own. That's why he had to uh, revolt and go up to Therese in order to challenge the prince, which he did very, very subtly and very brilliantly. Yes, I mean, that's uh, that's really interesting because, I mean, I started with the similarities between these episodes and you've really, you know, drawn out the rather important differences. And indeed, you've reminded us that <clears throat> the, although, you know, he sort of, Crete was a springboard that led him to become prime minister of Greece. He never actually enjoyed the political or electoral success in Crete that he did once he got to the Greek, well, once he got to Greece. Um, and that is, uh, that again is quite an interesting difference. I think just before we leave this, I'm, sorry, did you want to come in on that, Michael? Yeah, I just wanted to say that the element we've left out so far is his ambition, his personal ambition. His ambition, which he would say, and rightly, I think, was an ambition for Greece, but it was also personal. He found it very difficult to accept uh, somebody else bossing him around. As, as the king was in a position to do uh, with the help of his own advisors, and as Prince George, to begin with, was in a position to do in Crete. I think you've just answered the supplementary question I was about to put to you. 
yeah. which was <clears throat> reading your account of the events that led up to Therisol, um, I really thought, you know, why, and why does he have to do this? Yeah. Surely, you know, the way you, the narrative builds up, the obvious thing for someone as smart as, um, you know, and able as he is, is you work with the people you've got. You get the, you get Prince George, you know, you work with Prince George, you get him working your way, you keep on the right side of him. You don't need to antagonize him because he's not, you know, he's, he, he's, he's not a great figure in himself anyway. You could just, you don't need to bring it to matters to a head, but then he's in a, and the way you tell it, um, you know, it's uh, he really, it's kind of demonio, you know, a sort of daimon. He has, to, he just yeah. has to do it. It's kind of, is it almost a tragic flaw? And does that apply to King Constantine as well? I mean, when he confronts King Constantine, King Constantine is a, is very different. I think he he could be stubborn, but he needed his advisors to produce the arguments, which he probably wouldn't himself have been able to come up with, all of them. Um, in Crete with Prince George, I mean, there's very good descriptions of Prince George by the British Consul General, Esme Howard, uh, who describes him as a cheerful, friendly sailor, who said that he was going to run Crete uh, like the captain of a ship. Uh, and for Venizelos, this was a bit of a red rag to the Venezuelist bull, um, why should somebody, even a brother of uh, Crown Prince and son of the King of Greece, uh, why should he be able to dictate the policy of the island? Mm. Uh, and th there, there is a bit of a parallel because this is what he objected to. Um, although he didn't have the parliamentary backing to uh, justify his objection. Um, in, in 1915 he did, and so he was in a stronger position vis-à-vis -vis King Constantine. Yeah, and just before we leave Venizelos as a Venizelos character and sort of motivation, um, I can't resist reading an extract from one of those captions or epigraphs that you mentioned at the head of each chapter, which indeed are very telling. This one is Philippos Throhumis, um in, um, <clears throat> in February 1913. Um, so it's right in the middle of the Balkan Wars. And he says <clears throat> of Venizelos, it's strange how little confidence I have in that man. I think he's dangerous because he combines terrible daring with a complete lack of solid national feeling. The first bit I thought, yes. The second, the national feeling, where's that coming from? I just, would you like to comment on, the, on that? Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, the, 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 the Dragumis is called Venizelos a lackey, uh, um, not only the Dragumis, his brothers, but um, but some others too. And I quote Sikelianos, who, who was saying much the same thing at one stage. Uh, and it was this business of um, making up to the great powers, and particularly to Britain, which got some people's goat. Uh, and Dragumis, Filipos Dragumis, also objects to Venizelos's smile in the same piece which you were reading out, I think. He says, I, I hate that man's smile. Uh, but one asks, you know, hating the smile came after uh, the political impulse felt by the Dragumis family against Venizelos and against um, uh, playing up to the, the great powers. But Venizelos was ahead of his critics almost always, and he was certainly ahead of them uh, at this time when he saw that uh, the future for Greece lay with the great powers. It always had, and in a sense it's changed now because of the European Union and so on and so forth. But uh, at the time we're speaking of, Greece needed to have patrons or a patron 
in the great powers, and this and this was Britain, and um, you know, Ragumis and others didn't like this. That's why they didn't like his smile. I'm really glad you said that, Michael, because I was just about to say that you know it seemed to me that the overarching theme of the whole book so far is, and indeed of Venizelos's life and policy, is the need for Greece to work with the great powers. Yeah. And from what I know of his later career, I would I think that I think you can plot that through volume two as well. But we will see. We will see. Um, I mean, is <clears throat> do you think that is that a fair assessment? I mean, would you would you? I mean, I think you you know this is something you're bringing out, and I think you're putting a, you're presenting it in a balanced way, but in a positive way. Whereas the there are all this, as you said, um, uh, you know, rather uh, are rather offended by it. But I mean, is I mean, is is that is that a fair summary in a way? I mean, is of the overarching sort of thrust of the book that actually Venizelos he speaks for those Greeks who have always um, aimed at integrating Greece and gaining the best for the Greek nation within international corporations and structures. Well, this does get us on towards volume two. And I think you have to make a distinction between the years up to 1923 uh, and the years after 1923, the Treaty of Lausanne sort of uh, prescribing a settlement of Near Eastern affairs, which is still valid today, although um, it is questioned um, not infrequently by Turkey. Um, and the, the end of the great idea the Megali Idea, uh, it changed things. It changed them because it meant that, you know, you didn't need to have, or you couldn't have, one patron such as Britain uh, behind a, a Greek policy of expansion of the Greek territory. That was impossible. It, had, it was finished at Lausanne. So you had to develop uh, new forms of cooperation. And, you know, that involved Italy. It involved Turkey with Venizelos's visit to Ankara and so on. Of course, he continued to be on as good terms as he was able uh, with the European powers but it wasn't the same after 1923. So, I mean, this will be worked out in the second volume of the book and I can't, I can't uh, predict exactly what I'm gonna say about it, but that is the broad dividing line. It comes in 1923. Well, thank you. And that is a, that is a nice and an appropriate teaser looking forward to volume two.